The police baton has a recognized value as a weapon when used by a properly trained officer. It is the purpose of this film to present approved baton techniques, but first, let's examine this important piece of equipment. The Los Angeles police baton is made of hardwood, weighs not less than 12 or more than 18 ounces. It must not be loaded or weighted in any manner. It is 26 inches in length, one and one quarter inches in diameter with both ends rounded. One and one quarter inches in from one end, there are eight longitudinal grooves. A small hole is drilled through the baton, nine inches from the grip end. A leather thong is threaded through this hole, and after the proper adjustment to your hand, secured by knots. The correct grip is obtained by placing the leather thong over the right thumb in this manner. Note how the baton just clears the hand. Now turn the hand in and grasp the baton, placing the thumb in a parallel position. This grip allows immediate release should an assailant succeed in wrenching it from you, as demonstrated here. This in contrast to placing the thong around your wrist, where it could easily be turned into a handcuff. Harry's of attack. Starting from this on-guard position, a complete pattern of defense parries has been established, beginning with the parry to upper right, lower right, upper left, and lower left. Your stand should provide proper balance for both forward and backward movement. The overhead parry completes the five positions which can be used to advantage. You say you'd like to see a practical demonstration? All right, let's call in a competent opponent. Note this man's weapon is comparable in dimensions to the instructor's baton. And now let's begin. With an attack to the upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left and overhead. <laughs> this guy's getting desperate. No, he didn't make it. Yes, this defensive technique is very effective. Counter attacks. Gentlemen, meet your friend and mine, Canvas Kapok, who will be my able assistant. Remember, as police officers, we may only use that amount of force necessary to make an arrest and the amount of force must not be disproportionate to the degree of resistance offered. This technique is advocated when you are in close quarters and the assailant has indicated he has the ability to make a dangerous attack upon your person. Your counter should be direct to the solar plexus area, then quickly to the collarbone, and if he's still aggressive, then up under the chin. But to master this technique takes practice, so gentlemen, let's begin. That's it, solar plexus, collarbone, and up to the chin. Next man. That's the idea. No, it's not a clubbing operation. Remember, we use only that force which is necessary. Watch the technique again. Okay, now try it. There, that's better. Counter attacks are also effective when directed to the following vulnerable parts of the body where a comparatively light stroke can quickly discourage aggressive action. First the collarbone, shoulder, bicep, elbow, wrist, knee, ankle. Whoops, yes, it hurts on the shin too. Gentlemen, you have seen the demonstrations. Now let's practice our techniques. Pick your partner and form a large circle. By the time you graduate from the Los Angeles Police Academy, you must be thoroughly familiar with this phase of your training. Attack, parry. Attack, parry. Attack, parry. Listen carefully to your instructor who will help you correct discrepancies in your practice sessions. Try to counter the blow in the center of your baton.
Yes, this is the place to learn your baton techniques today so you can use them effectively in the field tomorrow. You must constantly evaluate situations on your patrol where first appearances will be deceptive, as in the case of this apparently harmless individual. Having been trained to handle any eventuality, this young officer is able to quickly counter a sneak attack like this. And once again, the true value of proper training is firmly established. Port arm techniques. Most of your baton activity will be with one assailant. But in those situations involving two or more aggressive suspects, this procedure is recommended. Note how the instructor's firm grip on the baton, allowing both ends to protrude, and his well-balanced stance provide him with an efficient attack potential. Now to see if this technique really works, let's prove our theory. Uh, how about some courageous volunteers? Notice how only a slight force is required when you attack a vulnerable area. Additional uses. This is a very effective control when handling a disagreeable drunk. Notice his inability to resist. But don't forget to grasp his garment to keep him from falling. Another use is the baton arm come along in this manner. Baton procedures in review. Make sure the leather thong is the right length and the grip properly applied. Remember your five parries and try to meet the blow with the center of your baton. Always maintain an on-balance stance. Apply your stroke to a vulnerable area during a counterattack. Excessive force is not permitted, nor is it necessary, if you apply your baton to specific areas. And above all, remember, diligent practice in all phases of baton technique under a qualified instructor is imperative if you are to become proficient in your patrol activities. officers to arrive, too late to catch the criminal, have protected the crime scene and called for medical aid. The officer in charge of the investigation gets an initial report from a patrolman already on the scene. He then directs the officer to accompany the victim to collect and preserve any physical evidence on his person and to make a record of any statement he might make upon regaining consciousness. Another officer is directed to protect the outside area. After finishing inside, the investigative team will move out here to continue their search for evidence. But the crime was committed inside, and that's where the search began. The scene of the crime. Who was in this room? What happened? The evidence found here may provide the answers. Later in court, the evidence will be needed to prove the truth of these answers. It is essential that one man be in charge of the investigation. He makes sure that all areas are covered properly and completely. One of the first steps is to take a photograph of the crime scene before the search begins. 
The officer in charge makes a preliminary survey of the scene to determine the objectives of the search. In almost every crime, the perpetrator either takes something identifiable with him or leaves something at the scene to identify him. Success in finding this evidence depends not only on the investigative team's thoroughness and attention to detail, but also on planning before the search is started. His preliminary survey completed, the officer in charge assigns tasks to the other officers. To be effective, the search must be well planned according to a particular system. The system varies according to the situation. In this search of a motel room, the officer in charge may assign the furniture to one officer, the floor, walls and ceiling to another or he may divide the room and assign each half to one officer. Assignment of specific search zones assures that each will be completely covered, that nothing will be overlooked. Regardless of the system used, the search team, as a first step, photographs and lifts fingerprints and shoe prints from all obvious places. This prevents their inadvertent contamination during the later detailed search. The room's dimensions and the location of each piece of evidence are recorded in a crime scene sketch as the search proceeds. It is important that each man understands his assignment and what he is looking for. In this case, complete details of the assault, clues to the identity of the assailant, and perhaps evidence of another crime. The investigators move slowly, careful not to disturb any evidence. Using common sense, they proceed in an orderly sequence to ensure that no piece of evidence is lost or contaminated in the search for additional evidence. After it is photographed, each piece of evidence is entered in a detailed log and properly identified and preserved. Identification by two officers assures a complete and accurate record. In addition to obvious objects of evidence, the investigators search for photographs, bills, receipts, letters, notes, tools, clothing, and additional finger and shoe prints anything that may lead to the solution of the crime. Latent prints may have been left in several places. The team collects and preserves obvious small objects which may have prints and they don't overlook paper surfaces and cigarette butts. Evidence may be found in many places. The contents of a trash basket are collected. The investigator examines each item to look for some obvious clue, such as a name or phone number, before wrapping up the contents. Phone books, magazines, and newspapers may yield clues. Evidence may be found under, slipped between, inside, stuck to, on top of, hanging from, behind any object in the room. As the search continues, more details are added to the crime scene sketch.
Persons in the room during the crime may have come in contact with the bedspread and left clothing fibers, hair, or other material on it. The bedspread is preserved as evidence. For this, investigators use a crime scene kit, properly prepared ahead of time with equipment such as notebooks, measuring tape, fingerprint kit, plaster of Paris, containers, labels, and marking pens. All the materials needed to identify and preserve physical evidence. Two officers identify and mark each piece of evidence, if possible, directly on the evidence. Later in the courtroom, successful prosecution of the case may depend heavily on this important work at the crime scene. No matter how carefully and exhaustively the investigators conduct the search, it is possible that some piece of evidence has escaped their eyes. To assure complete and thorough coverage, the officer in charge switches assignments so that each zone is searched twice. If the search has been conducted properly and thoroughly, the team will have all the facts needed to reconstruct the scene of the crime. And they will take with them all the evidence at the scene that may lead to the solution of the crime and apprehension of the criminal. Crimes are committed in rooms, stores, streets, banks, in woods, on ships, in the city, and in the country, anywhere that people can go. Attention car 883. Investigate possible hit and run. Two miles north, intersection of State 116 and Norwood Road. 10 4. first officer reaches the scene of the crime, he gives first aid to injured persons or determines, if possible, if death has occurred. He keeps unauthorized persons away and takes immediate steps to preserve the original condition of the scene. Traffic is routed either away from or around the scene. search team arrives, the officer in charge takes immediate command and quickly assesses the situation. Death has been determined. The body is photographed in its original position before it is removed from the scene. One officer is detailed to interview persons present at the scene. He records each person's name and address, and everything he saw, heard, and did at the scene. The officer in charge instructs the ambulance driver to proceed carefully so that he does not disturb any evidence on the ground. The victim's clothes may contain important evidence. Therefore, he sends one of his men with the body to take custody of clothes and personal effects for laboratory analysis. In an outdoor search, the search pattern should fit the type of crime and the terrain. The pattern also depends on what kind of evidence is being looked for and how many men are available for the search. In an open field with one main piece of evidence, like a safe, 
A circular pattern spiraling out from the main evidence in a search for other clues and the direction of flight would be suitable, but not in a hit and run case. The grid or double strip pattern covers the same search area twice, first in one direction and then in the other. This pattern is good for large square areas, but not here. In this case, evidence may be strewn for quite a distance down the road, and the officer in charge selects a strip pattern. The strip pattern provides a close and complete one-time search of a large rectangular area. String is laid out to mark search lanes. Again, a crime scene sketch is needed to relate the details into a composite picture. During the actual search, investigators look particularly for broken glass, tire and shoe prints, paint chips, dirt clods broken loose from the car, and any other evidence left behind by the car and its driver. The team has only one chance to search and it is careful to find and collect everything that might be significant. What appears meaningless today may be relevant tomorrow. The search team proceeds slowly, side by side, until a piece of evidence is found. The finder announces his discovery and the search halts until the evidence is cared for. Each piece of evidence is reported to the officer in charge as he coordinates the search procedure. It is not enough to find and photograph evidence at the crime scene. The evidence must be carefully collected and maintained, protected from damage and contamination, and cared for so that the chain of evidence is preserved. Only then will it stand up in court. Each piece of evidence is identified and marked by at least two officers. Measurements are another important part of the record of evidence. Each measurement is verified by one other officer. 38 feet, 11 inches. As each area is searched, the officer in charge moves ahead to plan the next step. Fresh tire marks indicate that the hit and run driver knew he hit something. It appears that he stopped by the roadside, came back for a look, then took off. But he left signs of his presence. Tire prints are as distinctive and unique as fingerprints. In court, a plaster cast of a tire print can be identified with a tire that made the print and positively placed the tire at the scene. Shoe prints are also lifted with a plaster cast. Again, two officers identify the evidence and mark it directly on the cast before it hardens. Two more items in the growing record of evidence. Some evidence reveals its story only in the crime laboratory. Paint smears may identify the make and year of the car. Finally, the bicycle itself is identified so that it too becomes admissible evidence. The search is over. Using proper procedures in a well-planned and coordinated search, the investigative team has found, identified, and preserved every bit of evidence at the crime scene evidence which may lead to the driver of the car. Any successful crime scene search assumes that the perpetrator has either taken something away or left something behind which may lead to his identification. Whatever he touches, wherever he steps, whatever he leaves behind can serve as a silent witness against him. A carefully planned and properly conducted crime scene search will find, identify, and preserve every piece of evidence before it is removed from the scene. Some evidence may be sent to the FBI laboratory. 
to reveal its full story under the scientific examinations conducted there. Because it was properly handled at the crime scene, it remains uncompromised, part of the chain of evidence. It is legally admissible in court and may be used to support the expert testimony of FBI laboratory special agents. These are the silent witnesses that lead to the criminal and to his conviction. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We find the defendant guilty as charged. Tony, you read this okay? Yeah, you're okay. See you later.
That's better. Ah, nuts. The lousy chisel broke. That's okay. I've got enough of a lip to jimmy it. Bye, Tony. We're coming out. Come on, we've got enough here to buy you all the booze you want. That's better. These officers protect themselves, covering both exits without risking death or injury. Then they protect every bit of evidence at the scene of the crime by not touching anything and by keeping curious onlookers away. And they send back immediately a call for assistance and all the information they can find without disturbing the crime scene. Assistance comes quickly. Detectives trained in burglary investigation take over. In a crime without witnesses, the investigator must overlook no physical evidence. Paint chips from the cracked safe are gathered for later comparison analysis. The camera is a basic tool. Investigators must be competent in its use and plan each shot to record as many facts as possible. A trained search for overt or latent prints must never be neglected. Even glove burglars can be careless. Evidence properly preserved by the policeman first on the scene remains intact to be photographed later. Even bits of safe insulation may respond to laboratory analysis if they are properly preserved and marked at the scene. Good investigators carry a kit containing all they need for this purpose and keep it stocked. Homely items like labels, boxes, or envelopes may keep vital evidence identifiable and uncompromised. A patrolman protects the scene of the crime. Evidence not yet collected must be safeguarded. The gathering, preservation, and identification of the physical evidence, the silent witnesses, will continue through the night. With the arrival of the proprietor on the scene, another important phase of the investigation begins. Interviews and records. This first interview with the distraught storekeeper provides enough information to complete the offense report. Basic record of the crime. There was nothing in the story to point to an identifiable suspect. A return visit by both detectives assigned to the case when the proprietor is less agitated, strikes pay dirt, thanks to good interview techniques. 
Well, no, no, I didn't notice anybody unusual. And I sort of look out for anybody who might be chasing the police. You know, I was taken for $3,000 a couple of years ago, a hold up. Was anybody apprehended on that occasion? Oh, yeah, they caught him a couple months later, robbing a bank. Now, Mr. Johnson, you stated that $7,000 was taken, 5000 of which you'd drawn out of the bank that afternoon to cash Friday paychecks. Uh, do you know the denominations? Well, mostly 10s and 20s. Oh, yeah, and a packet of new 50s. What's your bank, Mr. Johnson? A Citizen National. Do you think this will help? Well, you never can tell. They might just have a record of those serial numbers. Oh, hey, I clear forgot. Last time I was robbed, the detective said something about keeping bait money. Here's the numbers of those 520s I was keeping at the bottom of the pile. Good. Why not? Good, Mr. Johnson. This might be very helpful. Do you have anything else, Bill? Was anything else taken besides the money? Oh, yes, but it's not very important. Just three bottles of our best bourbon. Uh, <laughs> think of a safe cracker with a taste for 12-year-old whiskey. We will, Mr. Johnson. We will. You said that was preferred. Hi, Don. Hi, Bill. Hey, listen, get this. Four liquor store jobs up in Illinois. All skylight entry. All pry jobs. All front door getaway with tools left behind. And all with some of their best bourbon taken. Sometimes a few bottles, sometimes a case. Great, we've got something to go on. Yeah. Watch for big bills and good booze, huh? <laughs> Let's get out the word. The final item is on a liquor store burglary last night. We have the serial numbers on five of the $20 bills. Series 1960D, as in Denver, E366-3554C, through 58 c we suspect these boys were out-of-state pros, probably from Illinois, and that at least one has a taste for expensive bourbon. That is all. Fall in for inspection. You know. Some out of town is in the back room drinking it up. Another thing. Uh, what do you want, Faith? Three old Norwoods on the rocks, Joe. Doubles. Funny, they pay for every round of the 20. Now, see that, please? Well, what the. You keep out of this, kid. They'll handle it. What's keeping that thing? No, I take it easy, Tony. You still jittery about the job last night? No, why should I be? I got you guys away clean, didn't I? Sure you did, clean as a whistle. You know they did pick us up. There's nothing to tie us in with a job. We'll have the opening statement from the prosecution. May it please, Your Honor. Burglary is defined in this state as the breaking and entering into any building for the purpose of committing a felony. Burglary is usually one of the most secretive of crimes. When, as sometimes happens, it includes crimes against the person other than murder, for example, assault or rape, there may be surviving eyewitnesses, but such is not the case here. Our witnesses will be mostly silent. The exhibits that we will place in evidence that we believe will prove to you that only these defendants could have committed this crime and that they in fact did so. We will place in the witness chair the people who discovered, preserved, and analyzed the physical evidence on which our case is built. Detective Jones and I made a quick examination of the scene of the crime, during which I noticed a footprint in the dust under the skylight through which it appeared entrance had been made. Before attempting to lift the print, I photographed it and... Yeah, I made the usual search for fingerprints. Uh, I didn't find any fingerprints other than those identified as the proprietors. And then I gathered up such samples of physical evidence as could be preserved and later analyzed. I placed these in the appropriate containers and identified them. The serial numbers of the five $20 bills I kept as bait money. 
Well, like I told the detectives, besides the money, there were three bottles of bourbon missing. Like the one on the street in front of my store. I didn't think it was important, but they kept drawing me out to remember everything I could. Right after they were booked, Detective Jones and I got a search warrant for the premises where the defendants live. There we found the materials just admitted into evidence. One full and one half empty bottle of bourbon bearing the same tax stamp number as that found broken in front of the liquor store. I went through the clothing in the closets, noting makers or store names, cleaning tags or other identifying marks. Meanwhile, Detective Jones found under the bed a pair of dark sneakers. The soles were worn, but still had clear tread markings in the rubber. In one, there was a small piece of metal, triangular in shape, deeply embedded. Not to compromise this evidence, I preserved the whole shoe and added it to the other evidence which we discovered and preserved. Much of it was later sent for analysis to the Federal Bureau of Investigation Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Where I am in charge of the tool mark unit, I received certain pieces of evidence from the Metropolitan Police Department. Among them were the tools marked as being found at the scene of the burglary in question. One of these tools, a chisel, had a corner broken off. There was also a rubber-soled canvas shoe marked as being found on the premises inhabited by the defendants. Embedded in the rubber sole was a triangular piece of metal. Based on a study of the fractures, I concluded that the small piece of metal from the shoe was originally a portion of and broken from the chisel to the exclusion of all other sources. This was one of several microscopic comparisons I have made of samples marked as evidence and submitted to the FBI laboratory for analysis by the Metropolitan Police Department. I made a microscopic comparison between safe insulation marked as having come from the safe at the scene of the crime and material which I found in the clothing of the defendants. I found particles of safe insulation in this material of the same type and composition as the sample of safe insulation marked as coming from the scene of the burglary. Other substances found in the material were chips of paint. I compared them with specimens marked as having been taken from the door of the safe. Microscopic and spectrographic comparison examinations of these paints reveal that they matched in colors, textures, layer structure, and composition. We'll have the closing statement from the prosecution. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state now concludes its case. We have called many persons to testify. But it is here on this table that the proof of guilt lies. Burglary is a secretive crime, and we have no eyewitnesses. But these inanimate objects, discovered, preserved, analyzed by skilled police officers and FBI laboratory specialists, tell the true story of this crime. It is the story of a well-planned burglary carried out by professionals who made just a few small errors. Those errors and good police work have made it possible for us to build our case. The identifiable $20 bill, the whiskey traced back to the burglarized store, and to the defendant's habits and possession. The rubber sole shoe with its telltale footprint, and even more damning, the corner of the chisel which was used to crack the safe. The laboratory tests, identifying insulation and paint found in the defendant's clothes to be of the identical type as that of the burglarized safe. Each exhibit, and all of them together, establish the guilt of these defendants and exclude any others. On the evidence of these silent witnesses, the state asks you to find the defendants guilty of burglary as charged.